Yeah. Right, uh, next up is Alex, and he's going to be talking to us about his robotics project. Okay, well, so Project Claude. Um, there's my pointer. A good project must have a mission statement. Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's gone. Let me go back. 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 Stick to using the, the space bar. Right. So, mission statement create a low cost robotics artificial intelligence development platform for research and educational use. So, no small task there. Let's think big. Some background on robots. I think we can broadly um, split robots into three types so the remote control devices. Um, and then pre-programmed machines where you just set it up to go through a repetitive sequence of motions and then the interesting ones what we're really interested in, fully autonomous intelligent agents those that can sense their environment and make decisions about their environment and that's what we all really want to aim for and we've been promised these sort of things um, in the movies and so on NS5, the perfect robot, better than a human, can do everything that we can do and more. Um, but that's all just fantasy. What we actually get is something more like this. It kind of trundles around and can't really go upstairs and does a really bad job at hoovering the carpet. So, there is a lot of work going on in robotics, as you know. Um, ASIMO has been around a long time. It's doing an awful lot of interesting stuff. You can run and, and uh, walk upstairs. Um, of course, it costs millions of dollars. So it's not like you're going to be able to buy yourself an ASIMO anytime soon. Boston Dynamics, well, they're more into the mechanics. They made some fantastic feedback systems where you can hit this thing and it can still maintain its balance and it can walk around. They're really all the mechanics, not so much into the um, artificial intelligence, but they're into the, uh, the feedback control systems of, of uh, motion control. And now, it's an interesting little development, this guy. He's sort of beginning to get there. He's, he's a commercial product. He's got a couple of cameras, not where you think in his eyes, apparently, but sort of there and there. Um, so he can do a little bit of 3D vision. He can kind of walk around and get up if he falls down. But cameras aren't good enough for, for full vision. Um, his hands are not going to be able to do much detailed manipulation with those. Um, and, you know, he's, um, he's only a little, little guy, so he's, he's not, he can't do, he do a huge amount of interesting stuff. And he's got a little uh, onboard processing. He's got a small processor on board, so again, he's limited by what he can achieve. So, so yeah, they're doing a lot of work on um, balance control and uh, walking machines. But most people, when they make a robot, the first thing they do is try and make it trundle across the floor or, or something. But in my view, there isn't much point in, in going somewhere if you don't know. If you don't understand the environment around you, you don't know where you're going or why you're going, and you can't do anything when you get there because you don't have any hands, you don't have any good manipulators to do anything when you get there. Um, other people are doing, when they do try to move around environments, they kind of cheat. They don't, they don't do the vision. They don't use cameras. They don't do vision. They use these kind of laser, laser range finders. It's kind of spinning lasers which tell you that there's objects out there and how far away they are, but you can't tell what they are. 
they can't identify one from another. So it's a bit of a cheat, really. It's, it's, it's a way of controlling the environment, not having to deal with the real vision challenges. So when we think, well, our computers can do fantastic things, playing fantastic chess, can beat anybody at chess, can fly aeroplanes, fly up to the International Space Station and dock it with it. But of course, the most difficult of these things is, is doing the ironing. Because it's, it's a visual task, it requires enormous capabilities in vision and manipulation and strategy. We think of it as a mundane task, but in, in terms of for computers and robots, it's almost impossible these days. You, you can't have a, a robot which does the ironing for you because it's just, it's just too hard. It requires all this dexterity of picking up clothes and putting them down and moving the iron and seeing them. It's a real challenge. So, my first attempt at sort of challenge, tackling some of these problems, <laughs> this, is, this is Mark 1, you see it down here. It's intended to be a, a, an artificial intelligence platform. So that gives you the sensors that you need to take on these challenges. So we've got cameras. Um, cameras have got microphones in them as well. The, the gripper have touch sensors on it so you can feel when you've got hold of something. Um, it's got a Raspberry Pi in it as part of the, part of the system um, because it's, it's, it's aimed at the educational and research areas. Where you don't want to have to build all the robotics and mechanics yourself, but you're interested in trying to understand and work in the AI field. So I say two eyes, stereoscopic vision is obviously very important. People tend to put one camera on a robot. Well, that's not going to get you very far. You really need a sense of depth, and that's hard to do. Um, microphones, generally people ignore sound as a, as, a, as a sense when it comes to building machines. But it's a useful sense, and it really ought to be there. If you know how to use it, good to collect all that information, so there's vision sound coming in, sound information coming in. This little guy has got six servos for his arm. Uh, with a couple of pressure sensors on the gripper. Did I just go too far again? So, so inside we've got a Raspberry Pi and uh, a custom design board which does the low level stuff of talking to the, talking to the servos. Um, the main device on that is a FPGA, Field Programmable Gate Array. And what makes that so good is you can, essentially it's a chip which you can make it do what you want. So if you want to plug in a whole different set of servos or different interfaces to them, you can configure this chip and you can make it have the right connections for whatever servo collection you want to plug in to make your hand, your arm, or whatever it may be. You just add a clock, not that sort of clock, that sort of clock, a digital clock, and you start clocking away the logic and it will do whatever you want. For example, if you wanted a counter to do with a simple logic here, the counter is just declared as a, a register, so every time there's a clock, add one to the counter and that becomes a piece of hardware, it's not a piece of software, it's a piece of hardware inside that chip which is counting away. So, you can say you can create whatever interfaces you might want in there, you want serial interfaces, parallel pulses, modulators, I squared C or SPI devices you want to connect up, it's all possible, you just need to put the blocks into the logic. You can even um, create a processor. So it really is just, just a matter of, I think I'll have in my processor a program counter, an X register, a Y register, and some carry flags, and start writing code and compile it, and you've got yourself your own processor which does whatever you want it to do. 
so in this robot, this is a, as a processor in the FPGA, which just deals with the communications with the servos. They have these, each servo has its own awkward serial protocol. You don't want to deal with that at higher levels. It's all kept on that controller board. And at higher levels just knows about move the servo somewhere and all the servo specific protocol is dealt with right down at the low level. So that's what's inside. We took the lift up and have a look underneath as the, uh, the pie is tucked underneath there. Awkward thing to mount the pie because it's got connectors on three sides. So you kind of have to jam it in a corner so you can get at the video and the, the network and USBs. Uh, and then the uh, controller board on top. One important thing, I think, is that people have, experiments have shown that you, if you're going to make a robot, you don't make it move like a robot thing. You have to make it make nice, smooth, natural movements. And people will warm to a robot which moves more naturally than, than anything which moves sort of jerkily. And part of the trick of doing that is to be able to control all servos simultaneously. You don't just move one and then move the next and then the next. So we can connect them all up in parallel and move them all, control them all simultaneously. We can create a smooth motion. So, I would say two le three levels of processing. The lowest level, where we're talking to the servos, and their particular, so this is a serial port, PWM here. And, and that information is fed into the Raspberry Pi. The Pi gathers more information, the video frames, the audio frames from the cameras. And that can be sent over network. So that could be Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Internet to the big processing box. So if you're going to do AI and vision processing, you're going to need a lot of processing power, a lot of storage. You're not going to do it locally. We don't, the technology at the moment is going to burn hundreds of watts, so you're not going to carry it around with you at the moment. So you can send it off to a, a big PC-based processing system where you can do the big number crunching. Of course, once you've got, since it's network-based, once you've got one arm, you can have multiple arms. And you can start doing things all over. Put two arms next to each other, you can pick something up, and actually start trying to manipulate it with two hands, which is another level of challenge above what we're doing at the moment. And of course, well, if you have two hands, you might have two legs, maybe even four legs. You can just keep adding <laughs> limbs onto the network as long as you can figure out how to control them, you can uh, add as many limbs as you want. And what works, four limbs is very good for walking around. Better than two. And, and we can put different types of hands on if it all kind of is all on, on the network, as long as you know what sort of hand it is. Time, you can design different types of hands for different tasks. And there's probably a whole new industry to, to emerge of making hands and arms and legs and all these things you can't buy at the moment you can't go out and buy a decent hand they're just not, not available there's some very bad ones it's a very poor gripper this thing is they've put on at the moment uh, there isn't one I'm having to think about how to design one myself to make a good hand that can really hold things and manipulate small objects so maybe in the future um, there will be these things for sale. So at the software level then, um, as I say, the, the Raspberry Pi is gathering the sensory information. So we've got our own network protocol, ESP, external sensor protocol, and the Raspberry Pi gathers the sensory information, just like humans, and sends it across the network, so essentially like a spinal cord to the brain where we process it and commands going back to the servos essentially like the muscles telling you where you want to put your arm and how much force you want to apply and, and again of course that 
easily expands to having multiple servers out there, multiple um, sensor servers out there feeding as much information as you can handle into your brain. What we shouldn't fall into the trap of doing is, is just trying to write a program which does something. Just write. The, the brain is not a big um, computer program running on a computer. Somewhat different from that. And we really have to think differently if we're ever going to achieve this general world task of, of handling the real world. I'll put together a little concept, why it's all in clouds, concept diagram, uh, uh, and our nebulous concepts. But you think that in your brain you've got a kind of world model of what you expect the world to be or how you want the world to be, and then you've got your senses telling you how the world really is, and you're constantly comparing these two. You've You've got some kind of motives that makes you want to, to do something to the world. And in people, that motive is a strong motive of survival. But in a machine, you're going to have to create motives, make it want to do something. And, and when it sees that what it wants the world to be and what it isn't, it sends out information, control to its, its motors, servos, in order to. Um, make the world what it is. So when the world is, when the world view and your model of the world match, you're happy. And as you see on, on the concourse there, I've been demonstrating a sort of very primitive version of this concept. Um, so the vision system says, I can see a block, and if you've, see, if you've seen the, uh, the demo I've been doing, the vision system sees a block, and it tells this kind of brain where the block is. The sight of the block triggers a sequence of behaviours, which we to pick it up, to put it in a box. Um, and of course, like as the, the robot, the vision must have a, an attention point. So, in terms of the behaviours, they're all concentrated on a particular uh, attention point, which is where the block is. That's where you want to act on. So that's a, a key factor in, in design. You have to think of as attention. You put your attention on one thing and ignore everything else, which is something you have to do in, in vision processing. You're going to decide well, what's important, what am I interested in, and ignore everything else. Um, and then, in order to, to carry out his task of picking up the block, he uses something of, of called engrams. So these are, are patterns, patterns of, of servo positions. Importantly, the, the, the action of picking up the block is not anywhere written in a program. It's not a program. It's patterns of data. So it picks up these patterns of data of how it wants the arm to move. And it sends these patterns down to the arm. And the arm's constantly sending back patterns of, of where the actual arm is and when they match. And it's, it's achieved its game, achieved its goal and moves on to the next stage of of the action of picking something up. So it's all about pattern matching and moving patterns around and not writing code which actually does moves the servers or something. All the code does is move patterns of data around and compare patterns of data. So in summary, so we built this first version. Um, it's pretty crude. <laughs> got lots of flaws, but it, it gets the idea across, and what it actually needs, as I mentioned earlier, you need a better arm, a, a better hand, a better hand which can actually 
has more fingers able to grip more things and with pressure sensors that actually work because it's really important to, to know that you, you've got something and how tight you grow. Ideally the whole hand would be covered in a touch sensitive skin so that you can tell when you're knocking against something you can tell so much is achieved through, uh, so much sensors comes in through our, our skin. Unfortunately there is no technology available yet, there is no pressure sensitive skin material there's another technology which is yet to be invented, which really needs to be invented. So you'd have the pressure sensors of the skin would be another map. You'd have this pressure map coming in, which telling you everything you're feeling on your hand. Um, the arm needs to be longer because it can't, can't do much. You can't even play chess on that chess set because it can't reach the other side of the board. So um, a better, more rigid arm is important. And movable eyes. I think it's important to be able to, if you're going to get vision to work, um, it's a very, very difficult challenge. Shadows, different lighting conditions, all sorts of things. If you can move your eyes backwards and forwards, which is what, what we do, our eyes are constantly zipping backwards and forwards, giving us more information about the scene. And we probably can't do that, but at least we can move them. If, if something's confusing, move your eyes a bit, see what it looks like there, move them back a bit and see what it looks like um, from a different angle. I deliberately pointed the cameras down here. What I'm only trying to do is to understand a small world of, of coloured blocks, strategies of how to deal with coloured blocks. Maybe someday you'll be able to understand a chess set. Um, you have to do all that before you can kind of lift your eyes and look at the real world and try to understand the big picture. Um, we need to sort of understand the small world um, and all that problems that throws up before don't just put them onto put eyes onto a robot which can can, can drive around because you'll never have, never be able to figure out how to understand which is why the, the the self driving cars don't have cameras because nobody knows how to deal with the images that the cameras would give you um, so yeah that's it then we have any questions. Done silence. <laughs> okay. No, okay. Thank you. Guys. No.